please go ahead. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, Nasli, for the introduction. Um, well, that saves me this slide because th this has all been told by you. Um, so the talk that I give today is about explainable information retrieval. And some of you have heard of that before, others may not. Um, I'm going to give an introduction um, and show you the results of, let's say, um, a little bit preliminary study. It's a, it's a small study that was published in a workshop, um, but I do think it's really interesting to, to see what that was and what the ideas were, and as, especially because we want to continue with that um, in information retrieval in other domains. Um, so that was for the original study was for generic web search. And I am, as Nazmi was introducing, uh, supervising many students who work in text mining and information retrieval in specific domains. Um, and that's also a European project I'm involved in. It's called Dossier, Domain Specific Systems for Information Extraction and Retrieval. It's a large consortium. Um, um, actually, Live at Soparty is also involved um, from Scotland and it's coordinated from Austria by Ellen Henry. Um, and many, many people working on domain specific IR are involved there. Um, so what I will do, I will first present the, let's say the small study, um, that's the majority of the talk, but then I will introduce the challenges of um, the future work. Okay, so why do we need explainable systems, explainable search engines? Um, well, as you know, and you, you've all been working uh, probably in the last years with, with neural models, either if you're working in NLP or in IR. And um, although these models can be very effective, by the way, not always as effective as the simple models, um, as we will see later, um, but it's more difficult for the users to understand what is going on under the hood. Um, so the more complex the model is, the more difficult for user to understand. And the idea of explainable AI and an explainable IR is that if the system can indicate to the user why these results were considered relevant, that the user gains more trust in the system and that it helps the user making the right decisions, for example, which documents to, to open. All right, so if you're interested in the whole topic of explainable recommendation and search, I, I very much recommend to you this tutorial at SIGAR 2019, the slides are out there. So they give a very extensive overview of methods. However, until now, including this tutorial that I just mentioned, there has been way more attention for explainability in the context of recommender systems than in the context of search engines. Um, and in recommender systems, you, you've seen this, right? It's, it's, it's out there in the commercial systems like Netflix, um, you, you will get suggestions like users who have similar ratings with you highly rated this item, right? You can imagine this on Spotify, for example. You can imagine this on, on product sales, right? Retail, like Amazon, that you get suggestions and it's explained to you why you get these suggestions. You have highly rated items that are similar to this item. Or in the case this week on, on Netflix, this is in Dutch, but uh, what it's saying is it suggests Homeland to me because it was actually in the top 10 of um, popular shows in the Netherlands today, right? So it's saying a lot of people in your country like this. So you probably like this as well, as well right? So these, these systems make an effort to explain to us why they are showing us um, the recommendations. Um, in this work, we started thinking about explainability for search engines. And this was actually work that, that was being carried out by a master's student of me as an, as an initial step towards explainable professional search, domain-specific search. Um, and maybe you haven't realized before, but the search engines that we have been using for, well, more than 20 years, um, they do have a form of exp explainability on the search engine result page. And that is, showing snippets and in the snippets showing with boldface markup, the terms from your query. So here I search for Georgetown CS and I get my results. But what I also see is that in the results, whenever there is a, a query term present in the snippet, it's marked in boldface. And this happens, this helps us seeing the relevance of the results to the query. 
right? So this is very limited, but it's a form of explainability. Um, also, maybe that's also good to mention, as you know, most retrieval methods are based on at least partly lexical overlap. So word overlap between the query and the document. And this is a way to show that, to show that word overlap. So this is, this is explainable in a way. Um, so we build forwards on this and we address explainability in two aspects. First is on the level of the query. Can we show to the user what the importance of each query term is in the ranking that is shown to them? And secondly, in the document. So can we indicate in the full document what was the most important passage? And what we did, we used a very commonly used neural model. It's not really state of the art anymore, but it's still commonly used. A couple of years old, the DRMM, the um, Deep Relevance Matching Model, um, has been shown to be very effective for ad hoc retrieval. Um, and we do that because its architecture really allows us to extract these explainable items. So we estimate this, the query relevance term and the most important passage, and we show both of them on the, on the result page. This is what we propose. So here is, so this is, this is um, 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 let's say an artificially created result page. You, you should not be able to read this, but just showing what it would look like. Um, there is a search box here, radio waves and brain cancer is the query. And then here, there is a donut chart showing the relative relevance of the query term. So every query term is a color here. Um, and for example, green is and, well, blue is radio, right? So radio is more important than that. And here for each of the documents, what it shows is for the complete document. So there's this, li there's this very little, um, well, snippet here or a, um, thumbnail, um, and then marking the part where the most relevant information was. And the idea is that then, user can estimate, okay, when I click on this, I will find my relevant information there in the document. And we evaluated this with a, with a user study. Okay, so the questions that we had was, first of all, just quantitatively speaking, what is the ranking effectiveness of the DRMM when we do the passage level retrieving, retrieval, the, the most relevant passage of each document? Secondly, for a user study, we wanted to know how do users assess um, and judge the explainability and accessibility of the result page. So by accessibility, we mean how easy is it for you to, to, um, to estimate the relevance of the documents that you see here? So how accessible are they, right? So uh, assessment as in information retrieval assessment. Um, but also how well, how capable are users to actually mark the relevant documents in there? Right? We can measure that because we have a relevance assessment, ground truth relevance assessment for the collection. Okay, so these were the questions. Um, now I, I first go into the, the technical methods in the sense of how did we implement the model? And then I'm going into the, the user study um, design. Um, okay, well, this is a very standard retrieval setup. Um, we do pre-retrieval with BM25, that's lexical matching, it's very fast and effective. We get, we get the top 1,000 documents for each query. Then we learn the, the, the neural re-ranker for um, the top 1,000 documents, um, and that is based on the DRMM. And we can learn this because in the collection that we use, we do have relevance assessments. This is, this is what the architecture looks like. So what you see here at the bottom is a query consisting of terms and documents consisting of terms. And um, the, um, the network here, here computes the local interaction between each query term and the terms in the document. And what it then creates is something called a matching histogram. And what this is, is for each query term, we get a histogram of the matching scores of all the documents in the collection. Um, this is passed through a feed-forward neural network because in the end, it's a classification task where we learn the document is relevant or not relevant, actually in a pairwise manner, but you, if you're not familiar with that terminology in IR, you can forget that. But what is relevant here is that here in the last layer, 
there is a term gating network. And what that is, is it stores the importance of each query term for the current ranking. Um, so we have, we have a query that consists of multiple terms and they are weighted relative to each other based on how important they were um, for finding the relevant documents, right? So given the, the relevance assessment. So we can extract the relevance of each query term. Also, after the model was trained on a training collection, we apply it to unseen documents. So this is the information that we can use to get the term relevance score. So we extract the query term words from, from term gating network and we visualize them in a donut chart. So these are somewhat larger example. Um, well, they are all quite equally uh, important. Nobel Prize winners was the query term here in the collection. And um, well, as you see, all the three have almost equal attention um, or almost equal importance in the, in the total ranking. Secondly, in order to find the most relevant passage, what we do is we split the documents. And these were actually, in this, in this test collection, we had only unstructured documents. So we couldn't have really used like um, paragraphs as you would have in structured documents. So instead, we, um, we split the document in passages of 100 tokens, and then we retrain the DRMM on the passage level. Um, there is, there is a reference here um, that, that is something similar. It's based on that, if you are interested in this. Um, and this way we get a matching score for each passage instead of for the whole document. And we can get the highest scoring passage for each document. And then what we did is we ranked the documents based on the relevance of the highest scoring passage. Um, and we highlight it. So, that, so these were the thumbnails that I showed in the beginning. So this, this is what that would look like. Unfortunately, so this is in this test collection, we don't really have HTML formatting. So we cannot, you can imagine that in a real, in a live search engine, this can be nicer because for example, if you would show a thumbnail on a Wikipedia page, you'd actually see structure there. And that's not the case here. So um, it's just plain text where you can see where the position of the most relevant message is given the query. Okay. So um, for the results first, I'm just going to evaluate or just showing the results of the passage retrieval, how effective that is with the RMM. Um, and then we're going into the user study. So this is what we found. Um, so the test collection here is robust of four. As I said, so that is web search, unstructured documents, and very large variety in the length of the documents. Not even all documents have titles, for example. Um, and what we see is that um, DRMM cannot beat BM25 on any of these metrics in the setting as we used it. Um, a DRMM, where we take the maximum, maximum relevant passage, um, it does beat it on uh, mean average position. Oh, by the way, DRM does beat on means effort position also, but very little difference, right? Uh, but but BM25 is better here, precision at 20 and the CG at 20. Um, but, but at least um, we got a sufficient result here, and our priority was about the, the explainability and how well that was judged by the users. So we continued with this session, um, with this uh, architecture, because we needed the the maximum paragraph, uh, maximum passage information. Okay, then the user evaluation. This is how we set it up. We had a two by two within subject design, which means we had two interfaces, one explainable interface, the one that I showed you in the beginning, and one common interface. It was also static. It had the exact same information in terms of this, the, um, snippet being shown. So it was the same passage that was shown uh, for as for the explainable interface. But the difference is that that was not explained in the thumbnail and there was no uh, donut chart. So there is two interfaces and then we had six queries and um, each participant saw um, all six queries and half of them in the one interface and the other half in the other interface. And that was um, randomized, of course, and interleaved in order. 
and we show the top five documents for each query. So this is what, so this on the left here is the, the regular interface and on the right here is the explainable interface. The content is exactly the same. Um, we selected these queries, these six queries for the user study. Um, we did need to find suitable queries because one criteria, for example, was that the query has at least one relevant document in the top five so that we could ask the user what, according to you, is, the, is our relevant documents. The query should have at least a couple of query terms to be able to show informative donor charts. Um, and it should have, for example, a title because otherwise there's nothing really to show in the blue um, link on the result page. So these were the queries that we selected for the user study. Um, and then, so for the, um, the judging by the users, we adopted these criteria uh, by me and Zhang, 2019. They actually used the same type of questions to assess the interpretability of snippets, of like regular snippets, so non-explainable non but regular. And so they ask, so by looking at this, I understand why it's presented to me, All right? So that's what we did is by looking at the result page, I can understand why the search has returned these results. That's explainability, right? And by looking at the result page, I can tell which results are useful without opening the links. That's how easy it is to assess. So we had these two. And as a third uh, item, we had relevance, which is, by looking at the result page, can you tell which of the return documents are relevant to the query and they had to select um, the document. So if you remember, there are marks here like document A, document B, document C, and they had to click which they think will be relevant. They, they won't click through, they couldn't click through. Okay, overall results. So this is the dispersion of the accessibility and explainability scores for the two interfaces. So N is 66 here because each participant saw three queries in each interface. So we got three times 22. Um, and as you see, um, the explainable interface was um, judged better in explainability and in accessibility overall. So that was positive. Um, we, we did the significant testing and um, the, differences, the difference here was significant. Also some more details, this looks a bit ugly, but I added it because some people, if I say it was significant, full stop, then people might want to know how did I analyze that. So people who are familiar with ANOVA, um, they can interpret this. And so what we found using a three-way ANOVA was that the explainability scores were significantly different between the two interfaces, but also between the participants. So that was another factor that we took into account. And also between the queries, between the six queries. If you look at accessibility, then it again was significantly different between the interfaces and the participants, but not between the queries. So there the query did not have an effect. And in both cases, the interface was by far the most significant factor, right? So you see here, for example, the F value for the interface was 30.7, where for the participant was 3.4, right? So this is a large difference. It's also interesting if you look at the, the analysis per query, and there you see that. So what you see here is on the left side is the, the average uh, score that uh, people gave for a query on explainability in the regular interface and on the right for the same query, the average in the explainable interface. And there you see that for some queries, the difference is large, the, like the increase is large. And for others, it's smaller or even it's a small decrease. And what you also see here that on accessibility, the pattern is much more the same between all questions. So that was also seen from the ANOVA, right? That for explainability, um, the query had an effect on, on how it changed. So this was positive. Um, so we thought, okay, so users said, yeah, we like this. It's more explainable, it's better accessible. Um, but we also checked if they were actually better at selecting the relevant documents. And there actually they weren't. At least that was not significant, right? This is, a, right, this is quite a small data set. 
And if you look at the difference, so in the regular interface, um, so here we compare what they selected to the ground truth relevance assessments that we have in Robusto 4. And you see that in a regular interface, they obtain a precision of 53 and a recall of 62. And in the explainable interface, it seems higher, right? It seems much higher, but the, um, the standard deviation is incredibly large. So as you see here, um, with a standard deviation of 0.4 on, on 0.59, this is all over the place. So this shows that it's definitely not always the case that people are better in, um, in selecting the, the right um, query. So we definitely need more work here and we are working on it. Um, so these were the conclusions from this, from this initial study before I go into the domain specific part. Um, so first of all, what was the ranking effectiveness of the DRMM when selecting the most relevant passage of each document? Um, it was less effective than BM25 in terms of precision at 20 and NDCG at 20, but in terms of MAP, it was a bit better, but still wasn't really convincing. Um, but we could use it was sufficiently capable of using it for passage um, explainability. Users just are proposed interface significantly more explainable and accessible than the original interface. And, um, but we cannot prove that they are actually better in selecting relevant documents here. So what does this mean? Um, we were thinking this is interesting and we want to do more. And as a, I introduced in the beginning and, and as Nasty introduced, I'm involved in many interdisciplinary projects and we very often work in specific domains. Um, so think about health, legal, but even archaeology, um, communication science, um, linguistics, and, and many other. So um, my so so I I have a lot of experiences in working with people from other domains, working with experts, and my experience is that if people are um, doing information retrieval as an expert, so not in an ad hoc way, but really for their work, it's even more important to be in control of the search. And it's also more important to understand what the search engine is doing. Um, and of course, commercial search engine know, engines know this, which I think you can see from the use of Google Scholar, right? So even though Google knows a lot about us, um, we all have a Google Scholar profile, our results are not personalized based on our own profile. And I think that the, that is the reason for that is that they know that we don't like that, right? We as professionals, we as academics. So, um, and this actually has been shown by previous work on professional search. Users have the need to be in control of the search process. And um, my argument is that we can achieve that feeling of control and that we can um, make sure that they know what they, uh, what they are presented with and can make good decisions on the relevance of the documents and thereby save time um, by, by making the, the model explainable to them in the, in the, in the, um, um, the search engine result page. So what I've been working on recently, well, I've not very recently, but for this topic recently is the legal IR domain. And uh, in the legal domain, there are a number of, of specific user characteristics. And one of the most famous is that the search is high recall. But in fact, what we've shown, so I've been supervising a PhD student in legal IR for the last four years. Um, and she is actually collaborating with a commercial legal search engine. So she has access to, to real users and real data. And what she finds is that, in fact, precision at high ranks is at least as important as high recall. Um, and that's because uh, professional, legal professionals are expensive. Um, and one of the consequences also of, of that is that you cannot often ask them to, to produce explicit relevance assessment. So we have to work with implicit data. And they are in need of control. Um, if you look at the document characteristics, then what we see is an extreme variety in length. Um, there are both structured and unstructured data. The scope of the collections is, of course, smaller than for web search, but it's still large. 
and they contain many references. So there are quite some aspects there that are being used for ranking them. There is um, things like recency, things like uh, citations, um, um, where they were um, published, right? So this is also what my student investigated. What are the factors of relevance in legal IR? Um, and in the commercial legal IR system we are working with, um, the ranking is mainly based on lexical overlap, um, but there, is, there are some boost functions for recency, for example. Recency is very relevant. Document type is relevant. The, the, the position in the legal hierarchy is how important was the court where, the, where this was published. Mm. And then in bibliographical reference, that is um, uh, citations, etc. And then also something that what plays a role is that the legal domain is very nationally bounded. So every every country has its own legal system, uh, language, etc. Um, so that makes it quite sparse. But but given that these are relevance factors and that we and, and search engines want to incorporate this for ranking in the legal domain, it's important that we can show to the user how each factor contributed to the ranking and that ideally the user can select and deselect them um, right by, by, by filtering. So um, these are actually questions we're now looking at. So which of these relevance factors can we automatically deduce from documents? How can we implement those in an existing method for legal document ranking? One interesting thing here is again, we have been working with Collie data um, that's a case law retrieval benchmark set from Canada. And it's extremely difficult to beat the BEAM25 baseline for this data set. And that is interesting. So um, I have a new PhD student, his, work is, his name is Arian, and he works in this domain-specific IR project on legal IR. And in the past months, he has been comparing um, rankers for this stuff for case law retrieval, and he has been optimizing all these like long former, um, also CEDR, by the way, um, uh, Nasli, um, uh, I know this, this, comes, this comes from here, right? And he has been implementing long former, for example, in CEDR to see how it can manage, to, to make sure it can manage longer documents, um, DRMM, but also Bert, Bert Vanilla, Vanilla Bert, sorry. Um, and he hasn't been able to beat Beam 25. So this was very striking and, and with all these efforts, this is something we're still working on, but it's also interesting, right? So, so we're wondering if, if maybe in the legal domain, lexical overlap is, is very important. So that's one speculation that, that we make. Uh, or that it is a fact or an effect of how the relevance assessments were being made, how the pool was made uh, for, the, for the relevance assessments, right? If the pre retrieval was with BM25, that might also have played a role. So we don't know yet, we're still working on that. Um, and so what we want to do is make explainable IR, like this small study I just showed you with explainable elements on the result page to help professionals better find what they are looking for and assist them and, and gain trust. So that is all still open um, and I'm really looking forward to further work with that. It's also a collaboration again with a legal search engine. Uh, so I think that's really nice. Um, I'm on Twitter. My first name is my Twitter handle. Uh, some people want to buy it. No, <laughs> um, that has happened in the past. And um, you, can, you can also go to the web page of my uh, research group. Um, so that's it, thank you.